Okay. So I'd like to thank you all again for coming to another QFI seminar. So this week we have Dr. Julia Link. Uh, so Dr. Link got her P, uh, Bachelor of Science from Heidelberg University in 2010. She got a Master of Science in Physics and uh, also from Heidelberg in 2012. And she got a PhD at Karlsruhe Univers Institute of Technology in 2017. And then for 2018 to present, um, she's working at a postdoc at Eco Herbert's group at Simon Fraser University in Burnaby, British Columbia. From 2015 to 2017, she was uh, had the scholarship of the Karl Zeiss uh, Schiftung. And from 2020 to current, she was a um, research fellowship of the German Research Foundation. And today she'll be talking about hydrodynamic transport and a scale invariant non fermi liquid. So please help me in welcoming you either virtually or by immuning yourselves, uh, Dr. Julia Link. Thank you so much for this nice introduction. And just, I really hope that if anyone has any, um, I mean, questions or whatever, please comment because it's so, I mean, virtual talks is just it's so off because you don't see any reactions or anything. So please, if there are any questions or anything pop up, ask them and ask them immediate because that's what our seminar should be for. So I'm going to talk today about hydrodynamic transport in the Latin chair Aprikoso of Benislavski non fermi liquid. And that's many um, work I've done together with Igor Habut. And um, if you're interested, I mean, and those results are shown, I mean, here in that paper. So hydrodynamics describe the dynamics of fluids. So let's first describe um, the dynamic of a fluid. And an ideal fluid is normally described by the Euler equations. And the Euler equations says that the time derivative of the velocity density is equal to the um, gradient of the momentum flux density where um, the momentum flux density um, is defined as the pressure um, plus the density and the two velocity components f, um, alpha and beta. But you all know that we don't live in an ideal world. There's always dissipation and friction in your system. And the effects due to internal friction are described by the viscosity. So um, how can you, I mean, how, can you think about the viscosity? I mean, there you can think you have, for example, two plates. One plate is stationary, the other plate is moving, and in between those plates is a liquid. And the more you have to push the one plate to obtain a certain velocity gradient, like this one, the more viscous the fluid is. Now, how does this um, dissipation or like this dissipation effect shows up in our equations of motions? And this is shown up, I mean, this is taken into account by the stress tensor. And um, you see that the viscosity connects the velocity gradient to the stress tensor. And here on the slide, um, you see the most general form for a rotational symmetric um, system. And you see that we have um, two viscosities, namely the shear viscosity and the bulk viscosity. But the, for the purpose of this talk, and um, we will only focus on the shear viscosity. Now, um, the question is, how can we determine the um, viscosity theoretically? And in principle, there are um, two different formalisms. One is the Kubo formalism, and the other is the Boltzmann formalism. In the Kubo formalism, come up Kubo formalism the viscosity is um, connected to the correlation function between two stress tensors and the isothermal compressibility, whereas on the Boltzmann formalism, um, the stress tensor is defined as the alpha component of the um, velocity times the beta component of the momentum. And, time, and that's weighted or multiplied with the distribution function of the quasi-particles involved. And that's also the main difference between the um, two formalism. Um, so the quant and the Boltzmann formalism relies on the quasi-particle picture. Because in the Boltzmann formalism, the change of the distribution function um, is just due to the change of the distribution function arises due to collision processes. So due to scattering process between the two between different quasi-particles. 
So the, um, the cubal formalism does not need the, this quasi-particle picture, but on the same time, um, the cubal formalism involves um, the Maxibara frequency. And that means if we want to translate, I mean, our, our calculated quantity to a real physical observable, one has to do analytic continuation. And um, in this case, one has, I mean, one just has to be careful and especially for zero frequency, um, many small subtilities arouse because of the source term. And that means just like the cubal formalism for zero frequency can be more difficult to um, really get the correct result for the viscosity terms. But now for um, the next two slides, I first I want first to just dedicate to the um, cubal formalism. And I want to show you how you obtain the stress tensor in a condensed matter system. And then on the rest of the talk, we will focus on the Boltzmann equation. But so you just get like both, I mean both, yeah, both. I just want to present both ways how you can calculate the viscosity. Now, um, in the cubal formalism, so that's like a general frame, which was um, first, I mean, set up by Bradman in this paper. And um, yes, I mean, I told before, the viscosity connects um, the velocity gradient to the stress tensor. But um, what is the velocity gradient? You can also think of a velocity gradient um, as the time, time derivative of a strain field. And um, a strain field is, I mean, that's this quantity defined here. So um, that's in principle the derivative of a displacement u with respect to our, the original determin um, coordinates. So that's the strain, and that means we have now also strain coordinate x prime, which transform under um, the matrix lambda times x. And um, now you just assume you have, a, I mean, a crystal condensed matter material, which um, obeys, I mean, the following Hamiltonian. The P is the um, momentum operator, and S um, is just a spin operator. And N can be any integer. So for example, when you think of graphene, um, N would be equal to one because it's um, we have there the linear energy dispersion relation and S would correspond to the, um, to the sigma, so the poly matrices. And you will see in the case of the Lattinger Hamiltonian, um, this N will be equal to two and the spin will be a um, spin three half particle. So I just want, want to like you to think of this Hamiltonian as a representative for a, um, yeah, for a whole class of Hamiltonians. Okay, and now, I mean, we have our system and now we have, we apply strain or, on our system. And that means um, the wave function transform on the following way. And here you see that the um, square root um, of the determinant of lambda, I mean, this, this, the square root ensures that the um, wave functions still remain normalized. And now we introduce an infinitesimal change to the strain. And you see that the um, wave function behaves the following way. So um, this, firm, the, this first term is due to, to the change in the determinant. And the second term, wait, I hope you see it now. So the second term here um, is um, the derivative of the wave function with respect to the strain coordinates. And that means um, we can now rewrite um, the infinitesimal transformation due to strain um, yeah, in this way, where um, you see here that the strain couples to the strain generators. And the strain generator is a principle defined by this term or where the um, where we assume that the um, because it's um, because the um, it's this inter infinitesimal change, then this way we assume that um, this is not with respect to the deformed Hamiltonian and deformed coordinates, but 
the undeformed Hamilton um, coordinates. And I mean, this term corresponds in principle to the um, anti-commutator between the X alpha and space component and the P beta space component. So that means that's the um, transformation in the momentum space. Now, what we did is, um, I mean, we generalized this concept because, I mean, we still have here um, the spin which couples to the momentum. And that means you also need to consider how this spin transforms under the strain. And um, so you have in this strain generators an, addi an additional generator which acts on the spin space. And that is given by the commutator between S alpha and S beta. And um, yeah, what you can now uh, can do now is with the help of the continuity equation of, um, of the momentum density, one can relate the strain generators to the stress tensor because um, the stress tensor is, just, is nothing else than the negative time derivative of the strain generators. And um, that means for any condensed matter system where you have a momentum coupling to like a spin in any way, um, you can derive the, these strain generators um, by calculating the commutator of the, un of the unperturbed Hamiltonian with the um, strain generators. And um, in this way, that means we can express our Hamiltonian in um, an unperturbed Hamiltonian, so like a, a Hamiltonian which is not strained. And we have an inter interacting Hamiltonian where the strain generator act, um, is coupled to the time derivative of the strain field. And I mean, when, you, when we now go into the linear response regime and use the cubo formalism, at the end of the, the day, that's, I mean, how you obtain the viscosity, um, the equation for the viscosity. So, um, yeah, so I mean, the main thing is, I mean, you just have to know what the form of your stress tensor is and your Green's function of the system, then you can calculate the viscosity of the system. Okay, just a question so far. Are there any questions so far? I have a question. So are you assuming that the, whatever, the system has no shear elasticity? Because here you're putting just a strain rate, but in principle, there should be also response to a strain, static strain. So I mean, um, it's, so we are um, calculate, I mean, just supposing the shear viscosity. And that means, um, for example, you, um, when you just want to calculate the shear viscosity, um, I mean, the strain generator, which you implement would be the x, y and the x, y component. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if you would be interested in okay, so You're only interested to the dissipative part, basically. You don't care about the elastic response, if you like. Yes, but I mean, just the dissipative part. I mean, it's just, I mean, it's because the elastic part, I mean, that's just the response to the strain. But I mean, we're yeah, yeah. interested in the viscosity. And that means mm -hmm. we're just interested in the time derivative of the strain. So only this part, that's the part yeah. we're interested in. Yeah. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you. Any more questions? Because next, I mean, I'll, I mean, that's just the part concerning the cubic formalism. So if you have any questions here, just feel free to ask them. Good, so if not, um, I mean, if there are no questions, then I mean, so far, um, I mean, I've showed you how to calculate them, but you may also wonder, why is it important to know the size of the viscosity? And the answer to that is, um, depending whether this viscosity is large or not, the flow, I mean, the flow of the liquid is either turbulent or laminar. So it's really important to know, um, yeah, it's really important to know whether we have a system with a big viscosity or a small viscosity. And to get, in order to get a feeling um, for the size of the viscosity, one takes a look at the ratio viscos viscosity over entropy. So the entropy normalizes the viscosity. And that ratio is measured in the units of the reduced Planck constant and the Boltzmann constant. And just to give you a feeling for the different numbers, 
boiling water has a ratio of 8.2. Um, liquid helium, helium at the lambda point has a ratio of 0 0.7. And ultra cold atoms with infinite scattering lengths have a ratio of 0 0.5. And one of the smallest ever measured ratios um, of viscosity over entropy is um, that of the quark lone plasma, which is smaller than um, 0 0.4. Now in the year 2005, Cocteau, Zon, and Sarintis introduced a lower bound to this ratio, viscosity over entropy, which is one over four pi, which you see here, and that's roughly 0 0.07. And they used um, the to arrive at this ratio, they used the correspondence between quantum conformal quantum theories and um, ADS um, and gravi gravitational theories. And just to give you a feeling what this um, lower bound to the ratio means, um, the viscosity in principle is proportional to the energy density times the mean free scattering time between the particles. And it's normalized by the thermal wavelengths, so the De Broglie wavelengths of the quasi, I mean, of the quasi particles. And the entropy um, is proportional to the Boltzmann constant, and it's also normalized by the volume of the thermal wavelengths of the quasi particles. And that means if we divide those two quantities, we obtain the product energy density times mean for scattering time, and here then the Heisenberg uncertainty principle kicks in because um, energy times the mean for scattering time has to be always larger than the reduced Planck constant. And that means we can understand in one way um, this ratio of viscosity over entropy as a different form of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Or um, just to say in different words, it's, sorry, just to say it in different words, it's, um, It's the, um, it's the mean free scatter, so the mean free scattering time between two particles cannot be smaller than the thermal wavelengths of the quasi particles. Okay. Now, what I want to show you in this talk is what is the ratio of viscosity over entropy for Lattenschild semimetals? Do they come close to this lower bond or do they even violate this lower bond? And um, I also want to answer the question, what is the electrical conductivity for um, these Latin shear semi-metals? And just to give you a feeling like what you might or might not expect, I want first to introduce you um, what you see um, in a, what you would expect for graphene. So just to set you a frame that you maybe might develop, I mean, some intuition so, I mean, you all know that graphene, I mean, is, sorry. Graphene um, is, a honey, is, is a two-dimensional lattice out of carbon atoms, and it has the um, linear dispersion relation. And when you take a look at the ratio of viscosity over entropy and um, see the, the de dependence of the temperature, you see that for increasing temperature, um, graphene approaches this lower bound. And that's why um, graphene is a, perfect, per, is, is a nearly perfect fluid because it approaches um, this lower bound for higher um, temperatures. On the same, so when you, one takes a look at the electrical conductivity, what one finds here is that um, with decreasing temperature, the electrical conductivity diverges logarithmically and I mean, the reason for this is also that the um, electrical, I mean, conductivity is inverse, pro inverse proportional to the coupling constant. And the coupling constant has um, a logarithmic, in graphene has a logarithmic divergence due to the Coulomb interaction. So, you know now what to expect for these two transport properties in graphene and this hydrodynamic regime. And now at last, um, I want to introduce you the Lachinger semi-metals. Um, these, what kind of materials are these? These can be, for example, um, mercury telluride, the pyrochlorides, or the half-horse-like components, 
um, Ethereum, Platinum, and Bismuth. And what's so special about those materials is the following. I mean, on a normal semiconductor, you would have an S-band, an S-wave-like -band, band, super um, conducting band, and um, a P-like valence band. But now we have a uh, um, strong spin orbit coupling. And that leads to the fact that the S-band um, gets inverted. And um, our P-band is now um, a quadratic energy band, like with an upper energy band and a lower energy band. And the spin structure of these bands is the spin structure of J equals to three half particles, as you see here. And um, on this side, you see the energy dispersion of those particles. And the red line is the chemical potential measured um, with the help of quantum oscillations. And the dashed line is the chemical potential measured um, through Arthur's measurement. And you see, and just for the purpose of this talk, we assume that the chemical potential is always at the point where the two parabolic energy bands touch. So we are always at the charge neutrality point for the rest of the talk. Now, um, what is the Hamiltonian of this material? So these material have a TH or a OH symmetry. And the most general Hamiltonian, which is allowed under those symmetries, has to be even in um, the momentum and also even in the angular momentum, so in J. And just to remind you again that J in this case is um, equal to um, three, is equal to three half. And um, so this first term here corresponds to a rotational symmetric system um, where we have the energy, energy dispersion is equal to P squared over 2M. So we have two, the upper um, energy band is twice degenerated and the lower quadratic band is also twice degenerated. Now the next term here, this term increases uh, asymmetry in the particle hole spectrum. And the um, third term introduces uh, asymmetry and the cubic, so a cubic asymmetry, which corresponds to this term and the energy dispersion. And of course, um, the electrons and holes in those two, I mean, in the upper and lower bound, are charged particles. And that means they interact via the Coulomb action. So we also have the Coulomb action in our system. Now um, to I mean, just for calculation, I mean, to simplify our calculation, we can also rewrite this, um, this Hamiltonian in um, terms of the spherical harmonics for an angular momentum of L equals two and the gamma matrices, which correspond to a Clifford algebra. And they obey a Clifford algebra. And there are in principle five different gamma matrices in the game here. And the first term here again is just um, corresponds to the um, p squared term. This term introduces the particle hole asymmetry. And again, this term um, introduces a cubic asymmetry into the spectrum. Good. Any questions so far? No. Um, okay. So now you know our system. As next, we want to ask, I mean, we want to study the um, viscosity and the electri electrical conductivity. But how do we determine those quantities? And um, the methods which we apply is um, the epsilon expansion in the RG analysis. And we would combine this, R I mean, this RG analysis with the Boltzmann formalism. So let's first focus on the RG analysis. I mean, what you see here is the Lagrangian of the of our system. Um, psi are the fermionic operators. Um, phi are the bosons which mediate um, the Coulomb interaction with the coupling constant one over E squared, so one over the charge squared. 
And when we um, take a look at zero order at the scaling dimensions of the different quantities, we see that for um, the inverse length scale, scales as one. So the inverse time or like the energy in the system has the critical component is equal to Z. And in this case, Z is equal to two because we have a parabolic energy dispersion. That's why um, our critical exponent is at the zeroth order of the RG is equal to um, two. The fermions have a scaling dimension of D over two. And um, yeah, our bosons, which mediate the clone action, scale as D plus Z minus two over two. And that means that the Coulomb action is in three dimensions a strongly relevant interaction. And, um, and the upper um, critical dimension of the system is four. And that means um, that we have to introduce um, a small parameter so that our RG calculation remains controlled. And the small parameter is the epsilon equals to four minus D. And so we imp implement the um, epsilon expansion. And that also means that um, now our Hamiltonian here, we also extend into four dimensions. That means the spherical harmonics are now four dimensional, um, are now four, have four, yeah, live now in four dimensions. So they depend on um, P0, Px, Py, Pz. And um, we have also now nine different gamma matrices, and these gamma matrices in four dimensions are now have a dimensionality of 16 times 16. Okay, and um, what one finds in this RG, I mean, what is well known and just found in the RG process is that um, there occurs a Latin chair upper of Minislavsky phase, which is. Um, I mean, scale invariant phase. And you see here, um, the first equation here you see um, is the flow, RG flow equation for um, the coupling constant. And um, yeah, this ND, um, so the prefactor ND um, depends also in, on the dimension in which you analyze your system. So, because it, this ND um, describes the degeneracy of the energy bands. So if we would be in three dimensions, ND um, is equal to two. But if we are in four dimensions now, our energy bands are now eight times degenerate. Okay, and this, um, I mean, the, the flow equation for um, the coupling constant has a fixed point value, which is defined, um, which is proportional, proportional to the small parameter epsilon. And um, also our critical exponent gets modified and gets reduced from the amount two minus the fixed point values um, over six. Now what's important is also the fact that um, those terms which, which introduce the particle hole asymmetry and the um, cubic asymmetry, they are irrelevant, become irrelevant under the RG. So when we, when we um, let the RG flow, so those terms become zero. That means um, for the rest of our calculation, we can only focus on the rotational symmetric system. Um, yes, but I mean, that's so far not, I mean, not the whole story. Because in principle, you could also have um, silk contact interactions in your system, like these two guys here. And um, those contact interactions would introduce, um, for very low temperatures, a mud insulator phase. And then if we go to higher temperatures, you would have a Latin to apricoso phase. And now for the purpose of this, I mean, of this talk, and just for the purpose, we always assume that we are in this Latin chair apricoso space. And that means we can always neglect these um, contact interactions. And I mean, what's, and what does, I mean, like being in this Latin chair apricoso space mean for our physical quantities? 
um, we see that the, I mean, we'll, we will have that the electrical conductivity should have a temperature dependence which goes like D minus two over C. And the um, viscosity goes like T to the power of D over C. And the main question is, um, does, is, does the viscosity and the electric conductivity in, in the latent chair behave um, in the latent chair semi-metals have those temperature dependence? And also the question is, what is the numerical prefactor of these coefficients? And that's what we are trying to, I mean, that's what we are going to determine in the next slide. So, but before I go on, are there any questions to this point to the, which concern the RG of the system? Okay. Then, I mean, we go to the um, quantum Boltzmann equation. So, um, the quantum Boltzmann equation, um, you see that the, in the quantum Boltzmann equation on the left hand side, the Liouville operator acts on the distribution function. And um, the distribution function and FL is the distribution function which describes the distribution of if lambda is positive of the electrons on the system and if lambda is negative of the, ele uh, of the holes on the system. And um, I mean, this, the time of, I mean, evolution of this distribution function is equal to the collision integral. And the collision integral um, describes, I mean, as I said, the um, collisions of the particles. So it's the reason for the change in the distribution functions. Um, so the, I mean, as you see, the left hand side is now, I mean, we have here the time derivative of the distribution function. We have here the gradient of the distribution function coupling to the velocity. And we have the electrical force, um, which is um, electrical force, force. And I mean, that's acting on the um, momentum derivative of the distribution function. And now the question is, in principle, what is um, the scattering time of the electrical conductivity and the viscosity. Now, what I mean, what's remaining in this equation here, or what is not, I mean, what is not clear is the form of the collision integral. And the, this form of the collision integral can be um, determined with the Fermi's golden rule, where we have for, we have two particles, one particle in the state k, the other particle in the state k1. And those scatter into the state K2 and K3. And during the scattering process, the energy conservation and the momentum con stays conserved. Now what's um, really, so what is really important in the scattering process, I mean, is the scattering matrix element. And um, I mean, naively, you might assume that the scattering matrix element is equal to the Coulomb interaction. And that, I mean, this calculation with this, um, where the scattering matrix element was set equals to the Coulomb interaction was done um, by Dumitrescu. But that's actually n not what you should do because that's maybe a too naive approach. So what you should really do is you should implement, um, or you should have to, I mean, you have to use the Calder's formalism. Because on the Calder's formalism, the collision integral is defined as um, the product of the greater self energy times the lesser, self, lesser Green's function minus the lesser self energy times the greater Green's function. And um, you see that for here, for example, the greater Green's function. Um, consists of the direct self energy plus the exchange self energy. Now, if we um, write down this collision um, integral, we find that the, this scattering matrix element has um, the following form here. So you see here that this part corresponds to the direct self energy, this lower part corresponds to the exchange um, self energy. And what's important is that the, the Coulomb interaction 
gets projected onto the eigenstates of the system. And that's done um, with the help of these matrices M. And they're defined um, by the matrices which P, which diagonalize our original Hamiltonian. And yeah, and I mean, they have this form. And what's important is to know is that these matrices are now 16 times 16 dimensional. And that means it's quite, so just computational, it's quite evolved to really take all the different combinations into account here. Okay, but now what are the allowed scattering processes in the system? So we have, I mean, here are five different channels. The first three channels, those, um, those th first three, um, they allow the, um, they conserve the particle and whole number. So the first um, scattering channel is only uh, scattering, scattering is an intra-band scattering. So we have a hole and a hole, which still scatters to a hole in a hole. Then we have those two interband scatterings where a hole and an elect a hole, so like a hole and an electron. The hole scatters into another hole state, and the electron scatters into a different hole electron state. And then we have also the scattering process where um, electron and a hole. So the electron scatters into the hole state, and the hole into the electron state. So these three um, scattering processes are the only scattering processes which are allowed for graphene. And the reason for this is that in graphene, our energy dispersion is linear. So the energy dispersion is linear and the, we have the momentum conservation. And that means the um, phase, allowed phase space is restricted to only those three scattering processes. However, now in our Latin share semi-metals, um, semi we have the parabolic energy dispersion. And that means um, also so-called Uzi processes are allowed. And these um, violate the conservation of electron and hole number. And you see here, for example, we have a hole and an electron, and those scatter into two electron states. And we could also have, of course, um, the reverse process we, where we have uh, two electrons and the electron scatters into a whole state. And um, I mean, those two additional, additional um, scattering channels, when you do the numerics, you will see that um, those two channels have a huge contribution to the collision integral. So that means they also have a huge influence on um, the electrical conductivity and the viscosity. Okay. Now we have, I mean, now we know um, how our quantum Boltzmann equation looks like because we now have to term the form of our collision integral. And what we have to do next is we have to solve our Boltzmann equation. That means we have to determine the distribution function. Um, and this is done by the linearization of the Boltzmann equation. And um, as an ansatz for the distribution function, one is, it assumes the equilibrium distribution function, which is nothing else than the um, Fermi-Dirac distribution function. And we have an out-of-equilibrium distribution function. And you can think of this out-of-equilibrium distribution function as a um, yeah, derivative of the first um, of the equilibrium distribution function times the perturbation. And the perturbation is this H. And now, depending on which transport property one is to study, the per perturbation is, of course, different. So if one wants to study the conductivity, the perturbation is proportional to the velocity coupling to the electrical field um, times, um, I mean, yet to be determined function G. And the viscosity, of course, um, there the perturbation is equal to the velocity gradient, as I said before. And um, I mean, also times this unknown fact function g. And um, as an answer for that g, we um, assume the Laguerre polynomials and the psi n are coefficients 
which wait I mean the Laguerre polynomials and at the end of the day I mean we want to determine um, the value of those coefficients psi n. Now um, so we um, we solve the, this linear we insert this ansatz we solve the linearized, linearized Boltzmann equation and we have here I mean in principle the left side which corresponds to the part of the Liouville operator and then we have the Boltzmann and the collision operator acting on the per, per, yeah, per, 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 perturbative part H. And now I mean we can also multiply another H from the left and then at the end we um, obtain this functional form Q and um, to find the solutions for this um, for the Boltzmann equation, I mean we have to minimize this Q, and um, what we end up then is um, one obtains a matrix equation where we have the collision integral acting on these coefficients psi, and they're equal to the I mean left side of the Boltzmann equation. That means um, one needs to invert those matrices and then we find the values for psi. And this way we can then determine the electrical conductivity and the viscosity, which is nothing else than, I mean, the electrical conductivity is the um, velocity times the, times the um, so the two velocity components and the viscosity is equal to the velocity times momentum, and then velocity times momentum. And, and we have here these, um, the Laguerre polynomials. Good, so now you, you know the formalism which is applied to obtain the um, two transport properties, and now I want to show you the results of this calculation. So what you, um, we find, first let's start with the electrical conductivity. So what we find for the electrical conductivity is the following. I mean, first um, we find that the temperature dependence is equal to T to the power of D minus two over C. So that's exactly the temperature dependence which you would expect from the Latinshire Aprikoso Spanislavski phase. And then um, we have, um, and I mean the electric conductivity is also proportional to one over um, the coupling, coupling constant squared, and I mean that's at the fixed point value of the RG. And I mean what's really important is then the um, numerical coefficient, and this num num uh, numerical coefficient is equal to 12.84. And um, I mean what you see here is that um, the electrical conductivity decreases um, for decreasing temperature. So we have a power law insulator. And if you compare now this behavior to graphene, so in graphene we had the logarithmic divergence um, of the electrical conductivity. And that means that, I mean, our Coulomb interaction or in this case just reduce, um, or I mean, we have a really different behavior. So instead of having like an amplification of the electrical conductivity for decreasing temperatures, we now have a power law insulator. And um, next we go to the viscosity of the system. So the viscosity um, has again the, the expected temperature dependence. So it's um, proportional to, T is proportional to D over C. Um, again, we have that the, it's proportional to the inverse coupling constant squared at the fixed point value. And um, the numerical coefficient is now 0 0.086. And that is, I mean, if you compare it to the value of, um, of Dumitrescu, which, I mean, he obtained a value of 3.1, that's two orders of magnitude um, smaller. And that means um, that the, this projection of the Coulomb interaction onto the eigenstates is really crucial and you shouldn't neglect those projection of the um, Coulomb interaction on the eigenstates. 
Yes, and I mean, now we want also to compare, I mean, the viscosity to the entropy of the system. And the entropy of the system is also proportional to T, T uh, to D over C. And the numerical coefficient is nine over nine and the theta function with the argument three over 16 P pi squared. And when we now um, build the ratio, we see that um, this ratio is 0 0.137 over epsilon squared. And now if we're really daring and set like, and go back from our um, four minus epsilon dimensions, again, back into the three dimensional world and set epsilon equals to one, that means um, this ratio would be equal to 0 0.137 and that's really close to the lower bound. And that means um, the Lattinger semi-metals are a strongly interacting quantum system and the viscosity is close to the lower bound, but the lower bound is not violated. And I mean, here I want, also want to be, just put on some caution because I mean, all this calculation is a first order calculation. And we do not know when you take the second order into account how this result changes. Because, um, but I mean, the second order is really hard to calculate because, I mean, we, here we have now an energy dispersion with, which is parabolic. And that means like all those tricks in the calculation like Feynman parametrization for a relativistic system does not work here. And also, um, I mean, on the, in, on the level of the um, Boltzmann formalism, I mean, there you would have to consider th three particle processes. And that means you have to, that involves a lot, like I think three more integration variables. So already like this one loop result is really, I mean, difficult to obtain with these 16 times 16 matrices and like, to go one step further is really, really difficult. Good. And with this, I just want to summarize. I mean, what I've shown you is that the electrical conductivity, sorry, is that the electrical conductivity behaves as a power law insulator and the viscosity of an entropy had this, has this ratio 0 0.137 over epsilon squared which means that these Lattinger semi-metals are also um, nearly perfect fluids. And um, yeah, the Coulomb interaction reduces our um, electrical conductivity and also the viscosity. And the projection on the eigenstates of the system is really crucial and has a huge impact on the result. And I mean, for a few, for further e details, I would refer you to our paper. Yes, and with this, I want to thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, so if you have any questions, please unmute yourself. Um, may I ask what? Thank you. Great. So yes, uh, thank you for a, an excellent talk. I really enjoyed that. Um, I wanted to ask about um, variations in the chemical potential. This was all done at chemical potential zero. Yes. And it feels like deviations from that will be quite singular because as soon as you pop out a little Fermi surface, you'll start Landau damping the boson and then that's going to generate all sorts of weird stuff. It, is anything known about whether that problem is tractable if one looks only at very small variations of the chemical potential, or is it all very singular? Um, so, I mean, I think, so I'm not aware of any results um, for where the chemical potential is shifted away from the um, charge neutrality point. But I mean, what I would suspect is, I mean, when you shift your chemical potential away from the charge neutrality point, I mean, then you will end up, I mean, with your, with the Fermi surface. And I mean, then you can, um, I mean, do the, I mean, you can linearize your energy dispersion around those Fermi surface. And I mean, then you will, I mean, you will end up again, like with your standard 
I mean, with all the standard results, which you know. Mm -hmm. and, I but mean, I'm like, interested. Yes, and it's I mean that's also hard like, to connect, right? So as, as I take as I take the limit where the chemical potential comes back to zero, at some point the energy range where I can linearize my Fermi surface becomes smaller than the temperature, yes. and then there must be there must be some crossover regime where I go between these two types of behavior. There must, but I'm not aware of any of those calculations. And I mean, it's also, I mean, when you're really at the church, I mean, it depends also where, I mean, where your chemical potential is, because when you are at the chemical potential, I mean, then you have the temperature turned on, and that means you have always a balance. So you have the same number of holes and of electrons. And I'm not sure, like, I mean, when you turn your chemical potential away, I mean, then, I mean, this, those, this balance is not there anymore because like your situation is different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, any other questions? So actually I had a question. So this is a valid near superfluid insulator transition, correct? This calculation? I mean, this is valid in this um, Latincia apricoso phase. Mm -hmm. So in this phase where you have the scale invariance and where you have the, um, where your coupling constant flows to the fixed point value. Mm -hmm. And okay. I mean, this regime, I mean, in this regime, you can neglect the, um, I mean, you can reject, um, you can neglect all cubic asymmetries in your, in your energy dispersion also the particle hole, um, particle hole anisotropy, which in principle could be there in your original Hamiltonian. I see. So basically I can think of it not, not in general, not like necessarily near some phase transition, but more like near a charge neutrality point, like an analogous to graphene. Yes, I mean, it's, it's, it's like near this quantum critical point, I mean, like near this point, I mean, it's, it's all around this, I mean, you flow to this fixed point value, so it's always. So I mean, we're it's it's, it's true in these Latin sure apricots of phase. Yeah. And I mean, the the thing is also, I mean, um, and I mean, you have to be in the hydrodynamic regime, and that means your um, temperatures have to be small enough that defects and that phonons do not play any role in your system. But if your temperatures are really, really small, then I mean defects would kick in. So you're also already also there in your hydrodynamic, um, I mean your temperature regime where your hydrodynamic, yeah, regime is valid is also just restricted to also a certain temperature regime, which also I mean more consists to this Latin sharp because of Benislavski phase. So you're always in this phase where you have these. Um, scale invariance, the fixed point value, and um, I mean, this critical exponent, which is smaller, I mean, than this z equals to two. Mm -hmm. Okay. And do you know if anyone has specifically studied the gravity dual of a Latin just semi metal? Um, so, I mean, there are um, gravity duals where they, um, I mean, so the first, I mean, the first gravity dual were, was for a critical comp, um, exponent for z equals to one. Mm -hmm. And there are calculations for z equals to two. And they, I mean, they also obtain the same lower bound. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, okay. I mean, when they do the calculation, they also obtain this one over four pi value. Okay. But I don't remember the reference by heart anymore, but it's in, it's in the paper. Mm -hmm. Okay. I want to look at that. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, so, any other questions? I have another question. Sure. So, in uh, in this hydrodynamic regime, shouldn't the resistivity or the conductivity be proportional to the viscosity itself? Sorry, could you just repeat it again? I was just distracted uh, because I was uh, looking for your face. That's why. <laughs> When you are like in the hydrodynamic regime, which is yep. the one you discussed, where the electrons basically behave hydrodynamically, uh, the conductivity or the resistivity isn't proportional or directly uh, given by the viscosity itself? 
Okay, I mean, that's for, you know, okay, for a Galilei invariant system, um, there's a relation between the electrical conductivity um, that's equal to the, uh, so the electrical conductivity is equal to the local conductivity, and I think plus Q times then omega over Q, and then you have the viscosity term. Um, I mean, now, I mean, those systems are not anymore Galilei invariant because I mean, in a Galilei invariant system, you just have, you just have the P squared relation, but now you have electrons and holes. Who I see. So the conductivity right? that you are speaking about is this uh, incoherent conductivity given by pair, all, uh, pair of all event electrons, right, are charge neutrality. Yes, I mean, and it's just, I mean, I, there's, I mean, there's like for, I mean, Galilei invariant systems, I mean, there's this relation between electrical conductivity is equal to um, the local conductivity plus omega over Q times the viscosity. And I think, I mean, one of these, I mean, one of the essential things, I mean, is that you have, also, I mean, one of these conditions is that you have Galilei invariants. For example, in graphene, if you would go back to graphene where you have, um, I mean, different energy dispersion and the different, and, and I mean, you have these pseudo Lorentz, I mean, you have Lorentz invariants. I mean, there, um, this connection between the electrical conductivity and the viscosity does not hold anymore. In the case of graphene, you would have to relate the thermal conductivity to the, um, you, you would have to relate the thermal conductivity to the viscosity. So, so this is because basically the, the electric current is not anymore only proportional to the velocity, right? Yes. So, I mean, that's also, I mean, that, that's why you just have to be, I mean, careful what you're doing. And I think for this two, I mean, these systems where you have two energy bands, one bending up and one down, I'm not so sure if it's so straightforward to have those relations. Because there you have to be really more precise and more careful. Do you know if any bound applies to this conductivity, like some lower bound or something, like in this graphene story that they all discuss? Or um, I'm not aware of a low, lower bound. So, but I mean, this lower bound in the graphene story, I mean, that's also like I think, isn't this this lower bound also for the question whether you first set your temperature to zero or the um, inter? So the 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 defect. Strength. So I mean, there there is there are the questions also. I mean, what is your, I mean, what is the system which regulates your problem? I see. And I'm not sure, like, what what's there? I mean, what's the game in the Schlumpfer cinema case? Okay. And go, going back to also to the question of Joshua about the gravity dual. So what would be basically the? So one thing is you would like basically to have the scale invariance with these uh, normal of spawn and z. What other requirement would you have to, to call it like a Lattinger liquid or I'm not very familiar with Lattinger liquid, so. I mean, these, um, okay, I mean, I'm not, I mean, I'm not the expert in the gravity dual, so, but I, I mean, what I assumed is that, I mean, when your system has the critical um, exponent, which is equal to Z equals two, I mean, that's already, um, I mean, corresponds to our parabolic energy dispersion. And I mean, it has to be, par I mean, you have to have this critical exponent. And I mean, it's, it's also rotational symmetric because I mean, we have um, our energy dispersion is just P squared. So also um, your action in the gravitational theory should be rotational symmetric. I see. Thank you. You're welcome. So maybe I, <clears throat> excuse me, maybe I have one more question. So this may be a very naive question. But do, La <laughs> do Luttinger semi-metals obey Luttinger's theorem? Um, you mean Latin, if Luttinger semi-metals, and I mean, what do you mean with Luttinger theorem? That, that I mean, if I'm, and that the Fermi surface would be invariant. I mean, the volume of the Fermi surface would be invariant. So. With respect to interactions. So basically, the volume of the Fermi surface is still the total density of electrons. Because um, I mean, Lunch's theorem was obeying a Lunch of liquid, right? 
Yes. Um, I mean, first of all, I mean, here in this case, we just, we don't have a premise, but just yeah. a point. Yeah, and yeah. I mean, then, I mean, these, I mean, lattice <coughs> liquid is in one dimensional. So, I mean, where you have left yeah. and right movers. And I mean, here we have a three dimensional system. Which yeah. Is, I mean, which is different compared to the lattice liquid. Okay. So, I mean, it's not like um, lattice semi metals because I think also lattice was one of the first to think, I mean, was one of, those people who thought about those hematonies. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really, I mean, that's, and also it's, I mean, what's also special about those hematonies is that they, I mean, these particles, that they have a total uh, angular momentum of three half. And that means, I mean, there's been papers, I mean, also in, in our group, um, which consider they're the superconductivity of those particles, and that means um, because you have this three half particles, you can al now also have Cooper pairs with a spin equals two. So you can have higher order superconductivity in your system. So, I mean, those Latin chair, I mean, semi metals have a huge, I mean, have many different possible, I mean, a huge variety in physical phenomena. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, any other questions? So maybe I'll wait five seconds for if you want to unmute yourself and ask a question. Okay, so maybe let's thank uh, Dr. Link one more time. Thank you for having me. You're welcome.